All right, well, let's jump in here today. It's a little after 10. We're going to be finishing out chapter 4. And we took a long stroll through Genesis last week and uh, looked at the backstory of Abraham. We're going to look at a little more of that in other places today. Um, but ask questions, throw in some commentary, you know, comments and whatever as we go uh, so that I kind of make sure we're getting this because this is kind of some tough stuff what we're getting into basically the gist of it is there's this discombobulation going on hey Miss Charlotte uh, about works versus grace it was evidently a huge issue in the early church uh, because it's written about in just about every letter <laughs> of the New Testament there's this whole big thing about Law versus grace. Why do you think that is? Let's talk about that first. Why do you think there was so much confusion and discussion about law versus grace written in these letters in the New Testament? Because law, that's what it was. It was all about the law. It's because that's what they were used to. They were, it was just, everything was found, the whole Old Testament was founded in following the law. Which tells us that a majority, at least, of a lot of the believers were most likely Jewish. And that's why they were having such a hard time with it. The Gentiles, probably not so much, because they weren't bound under the law. We've read about all this uh, so far up through Romans 3 um, and going into 4, that a lot of people, the, the Gentiles, had no real knowledge of the law. Because they weren't following it. They weren't Jewish. And Jewish people had so many laws. Not yes. Not just the laws of Moses, but they attacked on Oh, yeah. What, thousands? There, yeah. <laughs> there's uh, there 613. There's 613. They were talking about that. In the chosen, yeah. <laughs> there's 613 core ones that they had established. And I think there was more beyond that, too, that they kind of penciled in along the way. Um, they didn't follow the first ten. I know it. And then you got the the main ten as we know it. And Bill asked the question closing out of the session last week of when we see the word law talked about throughout these passages, what law are they talking about? Are they talking about the Ten Commandments? Or are they talking about the 613? And I've done a few studies and I mentioned it last week. Since we got so many new people in here, we'll talk again. Um, there's three different ideas of a law. One is the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses. One is the thir 613 laws, which is the Jewish laws. And then there's others that they added along the way. And then there's just kind of the way it works, kind of law, like the law of nature. It's not written, but we know it's there. It works that way. And there are some things that just with God, it is that way. It may not be a written thing, but we know it to be true. So there's kind of some back and forth as to which law Paul is referring to when he writes it. And I'm not a Greek scholar. If y'all are, holler and speak up. Uh, but we'd probably have to go back to the original Greek to really decipher that out. But we could really generalize it and just say, this is what God said. This is how it works with God. Therefore, that's the law that we need to pay attention to. Well, if God only gave them the Ten Commandments, if He really thought it was necessary to have the others as law, would He not have given it to them again? Well, He did give them along the way about how to sacrifice, what kind of animals, uh, there's wheat sacrifice, there's food sacrifices, there are animal sacrifices, there are certain ways to do it. Along the way, God did give them at least some of that. Mm -hmm. um, if you ever want to fall asleep, I've been told, read the book of Deuteronomy and <laughs> Leviticus. <laughs> but if you can stay awake through those two books, there are a lot. There are hundreds that God actually gave them. But uh, the Jews, I think, did add to it somewhere along the way. I'm not a Jewish scholar either, but um, but you're right. I mean, some of these things, if God didn't directly say it, why are they doing it? We can say the same thing about a lot of stuff we do in our churches today. <laughs> we just do it because it's tradition. Because we've always done it that way. It's just the way it has like become. Certain laws we have, like some of the silly laws that are put in place, like... <coughs> 
like the very nitpicky laws about like business or copyright or just stuff like that like stuff like or even the smaller laws about like you can't park a certain place or something right so it's like finding somebody guilty of something that you did it the wrong way and, and yeah. you know they're guilty yeah everybody knows they're guilty mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> but they throw it out because it was done right exactly. because yeah the wrong way. Like that. yeah i mean that's they're, they're, You're still guilty. There's yeah. a lot of that discussion going on right now in politics about yeah, yeah. Trump and everything. And there's a lot of stuff they're trying to nail him to the wall on. Probably rightfully so. But they didn't do the same thing to Hillary. Right. So mm -hmm. the question's coming up of, well, you ignored it with this politician. Why are you being so aggressive with a different one for doing the exact same thing? Yeah. Or the same? Because they don't want him back in. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> They've got their political reasons for that. Uh, but yeah, there, there's tons and tons of laws that we could dig into. But I think as we peruse through and find this word law, and today we're going to look at a word called work. It's kind of interchangeable, and it's just doing the things that God would be pleased for us to do and, and knowing Him in a way where we just live a certain way that is kind of the law of God, I guess, if you will. Yes. You know, and, and if God gave us the law before Jesus gave us grace. Right. He didn't do away with the Ten Commandments Correct. and the ones that He gave us. But he, what He did was, no one can follow those laws. I mean, exactly. you know? Uh, it's almost humanly impossible. Oh yeah, that's so that is kind of the point. Us Jesus, right? Who brought us grace and fulfilled the law and fulfilled himself. the law, but right. He gave us grace and love because he, they, God knew from when He gave us those laws that it would show us. You that couldn't we do needed it. needed something more. That exactly. we, we were sinners. We could not. We were not perfect. Right. And there is no way on this earth that we can be perfect. Right. So he sent us himself. Mm -hmm. And human form, but he was also God. He was yeah. perfect. But he, sh to show us that Yes, I'm human, and yes, I have the same things that I face every moment of every day. He right. faced the devil constantly. Oh, absolutely. But he did not give in to the devil. Right. He was and tempted we, at all points, like as we are, yet without sin, is what exactly. the Bible says. Exactly, and, and we, no matter how devout <clears throat> we are, even if we don't just jump in full force in our mind we give in to the devil almost daily oh sure even absolutely. if it's just in our mind and god says if you've thought it you've done it mm -hmm. right yeah so there's no yeah possible. it goes down to that jesus said you know if you even look with lust you've committed adultery exactly. if you hate someone you've committed murder it's it's there's even that element of guilt if it's just in your mind Absolutely. And Paul addresses this as, uh, for those who maybe haven't heard this part, Romans is broken down into four major parts. Uh, the first part is the problem of sin. And we close that out in chapter 20, I'm sorry, verse 20 of chapter 3. And he concluded the whole first part of the, chap of the book of the problem of sin with this thought. Ver verse 20 of chapter 3 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the whole reason for the law, is so that we have a knowledge of what is sinful. If you don't think you're sinning, why, you know, why be saved? Right. If, you're, and, if you think yeah. that you're doing everything right, and you're thinking everything right. right. Oh, well, that just didn't mean anything. And, and John addressed that in his 
his other epistles where he says, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. Yeah. <laughs> you just you're lying right to yourself. You just sin. You, yeah. But the law, you just sin. Exactly. <laughs> but, the, but grace, but Jesus came and at well, the law was the law shows us we have sin. Exactly. That, and that's <laughs> the point. Realize, I can't do this. I can't. Exactly. I can't be perfect. I, I thought I was doing everything right. Right, and that is the point of the law to show us that we're not, and to show us all these things. So we took a journey last week of Abraham's life, and just to kind of recap that in thirty seconds, he's introduced to us in Genesis eleven. He starts his journey at age seventy-five in Genesis twelve. <laughs> And it wasn't until Genesis 17 that the covenant of the circumcision was given. So five chapters goes by that God has already promised him, and this is talked about continuously throughout this chapter. God has already talked to him about the promises of a land, of a, of a, na of a world, basically that will be blessed through him. And all of those promises were made to him before the work of circumcision. And that's kind of Paul's point here. He's saying all of these promises were made before he took any actions. Before the whole thing on the mount with his son Isaac. Before all of that, the promises were already made. And he keeps going into that over and over and over again. And uh, let's go back just a minute to review verse 9, let's say. It says, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, were upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? Was he uh, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? It says not in circumcision. This is chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Again, before chapter 17 of Genesis, basically. God made him all these promises that of your seed... The whole world is going to be blessed. Well, Sarah couldn't have kids. <laughs> and they were confused. And they jumped the gun. They end up having Ishmael and all that. Then he has this conversation with God about Ishmael. And God's like, I hear you. But, no, you're going to have another child that I'm going to let you have through Sarah. Keeping in mind, he's 100 years old at that point. She's 90. <laughs> They're both laughing about it. But we find out in the book of Hebrews later today, if we get there that they were still believing. Even though they were like, that's kind of ridiculous, they still had faith in it and moved forward. And through Isaac were the promises made. And we have those same promises. We'll read about that today as well. Uh, but the point is being made that this was all before works. This was all before Moses. Again, we looked at the timeline last week. This is around the year 2000 B.C., Moses wasn't even born until 1500 B.C., 500 years later. And it wasn't until he was in his 70s, 80s probably, that God even gave them the law of Moses. So this was 500 years before all that. No law. Nothing written. Nothing established. Keeping in mind that there was no such thing as Hebrews. Not the book, but the people. <laughs> there was no such thing as Israelites before Abraham. He was the first. He's called he, uh, Abraham, Abram the Hebrew. I think it was in chapter 14 or somewhere in there. Uh, for the very first time in the Bible. He had nothing to go on, yet God had already made him all of these promises. And that's kind of the point that he's really driving home. And I spent a lot of time last week on that. And verse 11 we continue to move forward. It says, And he received the sign of circumcision. This is chapter 17 of the book of Genesis. Um, the seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had being uncircumcised. So he received this before he even knew about it. He received it for the very first time. This is a brand new thing for him and for the whole world. That he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, 
which he had being yet uncircumcised. He's really driving this point home that Abraham had faith before any of the works were even brought up. Before the law was 500 years before the law was even an idea. So why did the Old Testament saints up before Abraham when they died, did they go to hell? Did they go to heaven? Did they go nowhere? There was no law. So what's up with that? <laughs> A lot of people have that question. They're like, I don't know. But going back to Romans 2, verse 15, 14 and 15, says, When the Gentiles, we could say this even pre-Abraham, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which shows the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. Why in the world was Cain and Abel bringing a sacrifice to God before, well, this was 4000 BC, so you're talking 2,500 years before the law even was given by God to humanity. Why were sacrifices being made? There was no law. Because God was there and He told them. Okay. Because well, nature, I guess. Because they had conversations with God. Yeah. And that's the exactly. law of God, a lot of the times that Paul's talking about, of even before the law, there was still a law. <laughs> this is still how it worked. Sin requires a sacrifice. That goes all the way back to the very first sin. Adam and Eve sinned. There was a sacrifice made. Animals were killed to give them coats of skins to wear moving forward. That was the first ordination of killing something, shedding blood to cover sin, literally in that case, but also figuratively and spiritually. So that was a law, even 2,500 years before the law was written by the finger of God on the Ten Commandment tablets that Moses brought down. Before then, the God walked with him yeah, he, in the garden. I mean, God himself. Physically. Physically that was the pre-incarnate Jesus. And right, and, and he had a body. And he, you know, he was not silent. When oh, he absolutely. Was walk, making those walks with yeah. them. They had a he conversation. Was teaching them exactly. So all these things were established even before the law, just because of these conversations that were taking place. I don't know if we've ever really thought about that, but yeah. the, these things have always been since the beginning of humanity. That God has had rules and regulations. He writ, wrote it on our hearts. He still writes it on our hearts, according to Romans chapter 2. Even atheists have these standards. They have a moral compass because God has put it on their hearts via their conscience of what is right and wrong. They'll deny that, and they'll say, well, we just came up with that ourselves. Well, if that's the case, why does every person on the planet have the same moral compass? It's because there's a higher authority and we're subject to it, even though we may not admit it. Even they believe in a higher authority. Some of them. They don't, well. Some of them do, some of them, yeah, it's questionable. <laughs> well, some of them say we make our own rules and you know it's just whatever we want to make out of we it. We have to get those rules from somewhere. From somewhere, yeah, exactly. You know, the only people who didn't get them from somewhere got them from God. Exactly. The Creator. And in, when he made all the different, created all the different people, all this was passed down. Right. Even before there was written. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it was just there because God had a standard and people knew and understood that it was there. And that they because were following God it. God gave it to those first people. Right. And then he had to give them it again. And it took them 2,500 years. He finally said, well, I guess I better write this I down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're not getting it. I'm going to write right. this down for them. They're not listening. <laughs> To get George straight, write this down, yeah, make a little yeah. note. <laughs> That's the only thing he's saying. So verse 13 goes on. We'll get into the new part and kind of head towards the end of the chapter here. It says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 
Again, all this is before the law, the written law, was given. And this was before the, the, the covenant of the uh, circumcision. Verse 14 says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might uh, be sure to all the seed, not, and not to that only which is of the law, but also that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So what do we make of any, any questions? That's kind of a lot there, but I want to make sure we kind of gather the points here. He, he's just really driving home, this is faith. It's faith-based. It's faith-based. It's faith-based. It's faith-based. So, I have a question. yes. So did faith begin with Abraham, or did it begin with Adam and Eve? I believe with Adam and Eve. Okay. okay. I mean... Well, I, I was... It, 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 that just didn't compute. I mean, didn't yeah. Compute. So let's think of some people. Well, I mean, Abraham was obviously the first forefather, but Abraham was year 2000. When was the flood? Was Trivia before question. Before him. Before him, 2348, best we can determine. So who was involved with the so flood? Noah had faith. Noah had okay, faith. So, so yeah, okay. faith has always been there, been a part of it. Um, so, I'm going to throw a wrench in our cogs this morning. It's by faith, right? It's by faith, by faith, by faith. We've already been through this for some of us who went through the book of James. Chapter 1 of the book, of, no, chapter 2 of the book of James, verse 14, says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him? This is again James 2, I'm in verse 14. 15 now. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? It's like seeing a homeless person on the street saying, Hey man, I hope you have a great meal. And then you just pull off. You don't give them food, you don't give them money, you don't give them nothing, but you say you hope they're filled and they're warmed. That's what he's saying here. Even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Here we go to Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that uh, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, interesting illustration there, so faith without works is dead also. So almost sounds contradictory, but it's not. It is by faith. Faith has to come first. The works then will demonstrate how much faith you actually have. If you have the faith, you're going to want to do the works. Exactly. If you have the faith, you're going to want to do the works. The biggest issue for a lot of churches, and especially legalism that's been rampant for decades, is they kind of put the cart before the horse and they say, well, by doing these things, you're working your way to heaven. You're getting there because of the things you do. No, you're getting there because of faith in Jesus Christ. 
But don't go the other way as some of these liberal churches are doing and say all it takes is faith and nothing else. You can live however yeah. you want to live. I can do what I want to do. Because that doesn't work. That doesn't show evidence that you're actually saved and that you really truly have the faith. You know, Abraham had faith. We, we discover this in the book of Hebrews. He had faith when he took Isaac up to that mountain to kill him that God was going to raise him from the dead. We read that over in Hebrews. It's been a year ago now, I guess, when we're going through some of this stuff. But he believed that God would raise his son from the dead. Otherwise, how in the world would the promises mm -hmm. that had been made to him ever come to pass? And that's kind of what Paul was wrestling with here. So, real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Four. Yes. Back in James. Yes. You yes. see that a man is justified by works. Our only justification is through the blood of Christ. Right. But you're. But where's the evidence if you have nothing to show for it? You're showing. We're justified. We're just trying you're, to. Right. You're showing your faith through your works. I, I get that. I get that. The word justified is the word I'm trying Yeah. It, it is. That's what I'll say. This gets a little squirrely. And that's why I'm kind but of. We're not justified no matter what we do. Right. Or if without the blood of Christ we can do everything perfect and still go to hell, right. because it's not about works; it's about faith first, and then works mixed in with the faith that demonstrates the evidence that that is where we're going. Does it mean that your faith is justified by your works instead of you being justified? I'd have to go study the again the the Greek word being used here for justified. I, I'm not that smart right now at the moment. Does anybody else know? <laughs> but he uses this word twice in 24 and 25. It says, then see how by, by works, it doesn't say through works, but by works, meaning your faith mixed with your works, shows that you are justified. Would probably be a better way of saying that. I, I hesitate to even use that phrase. But he says, by works a man is justified, not by faith only. He doesn't say not by faith, period. Not by faith only. Meaning, there's, there's got to be some evidence there, I think is what he's getting at. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? Now what is that even referring to? Right, so how, how, I mean, where's the evidence that she was justified? She was saved. Obviously. Yeah, her house wasn't destroyed with the rest of the city. <laughs> so she was saved. Her house was preserved and it wasn't toppled down on top of her. Therefore, God honored her for what she did, even though she was formerly a harlot. But she helped these guys out because she feared God. And she was justified through the fact that she helped them get out of there and not get killed. And she is also mentioned in the lineage of Christ. <laughs> so she had to have had faith. Absolutely. Yeah, she, has, she had to have faith. So, and again, James is a little bit different kind of mindset. It's very harsh. Um, a lot of people have trouble, pr trouble with James with that. But just to point out, he even mentions, even with his mindset, he mentions that Abraham believed God and it was puted unto him for righteousness. But he also points out that it, through his works mixed with his faith is what really evidently made an impact on him. And I don't think that these letters are isolated to one person. I think they're to all of us to read. Uh, so I think, I guess for me, it's important to show that our works are important. They don't get us there but they are important to demonstrate that we are going um, in the direction of God. You know, Abraham met with Jesus. One of the three strangers right. was Jesus. Absolutely. Sarah never, not from... She was in a tent close by to that conversation. But she never had... had, had she never met with Jesus and had it told to her herself right it trickled down to her so galatians 3 this is where i was going next which actually covers that <laughs> oh, good. so galatians 3 
um, we see this is chapter 3 of the book. And he goes, he starts off by saying, Oh, foolish Galatians. <laughs> I mean, he's three chapters in and he's still calling them foolish. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth uh, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law. So here they're talking about receiving the Holy Spirit. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Have you begun in the Spirit and now you're made perfect by the flesh? Because they're still twisting this up saying that works are so important that without them you can't go to heaven. Not true. And Paul's pointing this out in this letter. He's, he's dealing with this all over the globe as he's writing all these different churches. And these are churches he's writing to. It says, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore hath ministered to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you. Doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Here we go back to Abraham. Abraham is brought up over and over and over and over again as the example. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, there you go, Greg, preached before you the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. He's referring to Jesus being the seed and us inheriting it through our faith in Jesus Christ. So then they which be of faith are blessed with Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the books of the law to do them but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Again, there you go. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So if you're going to live your life according to the law, you're going to be judged according to the law, which we're all going to be held guilty in the end. But if we live our lives in faith in Christ who fulfilled the law, were found innocent because of his sacrifice on our behalf. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Does that answer the question? <laughs> so, yes, works are important, but faith is more important. Faith is what it's all about. But faith without works leaves in question, are you genuinely a converted believer? So faith drives works. Faith well, should drive the works, not the other way around. So Abraham, had he not had this faith, ingrained faith right. that God put in him. Jesus could have talked to him till he was blue in the face. Sure. He could have promised him the world and he wouldn't have believed him right. unless he had this. And the test of Isaac is what drew that to a surface. And even right. after that, God said, now I know you are going to be faithful to me in all things. And I think you know, God always knew, mm -hmm. but I think it was showing it to Abraham. Now you can know, because you are willing to go through with this, that you're, you're going to be able to be used and be blessed, and the whole world is going to be and blessed through you. generations forever Still us today. will know exactly. because of the faith of Abraham. Exactly. And that's the point of the faith of Abraham, not the works. And they're getting all called up in works. Is that what it's about? Is it the law? Paul keeps saying, no, it's not the law. Law is important, but it's not how you're going to get there. And that's what he's really driving home. Verse 17, he goes on to say, As it is written, 
I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, and called those things which be not as though they were, which is an interesting phrase. Basically he's saying he called everything into existence through the creation process. Who against hope believed in hope. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Abraham. They're talking about Abraham here. He says, Who against hope believed in hope. Why would it be against hope? Well, he was a hundred years old. <laughs> still hadn't had a kid with Sarah. Sarah was ninety and still I'm barren. Thinking, even it more. was against hope. <laughs> Even so, believed in the hope that he might become the father of many nations. And again, if you go over there and read, it's uh, Hebrews 11.11 11 actually says that Sarah had faith in what God was saying as she overheard that conversation you're referring to. Uh, it says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He's saying they understood the situation, <laughs> but they still believed. says that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And so this kind of clarifies, because I, I believe that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this clarifies, some people said, well, Abraham and Sarah both doubted it. Because they laughed. Well, maybe that was just their initial reaction, but maybe it settled in. And this clarifies that they did have faith in what he was saying. They well, did I'm have Christian faith. I'm a Christian and I have doubts. Absolutely. Sometimes. We all do at times. That's the humanness in us. And Hebrews 11 clarifies that they had faith and they trusted. It keeps saying over and over and over again all throughout the Bible, Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteous mistakes. Here it says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Abraham was fully convinced that what God has promised, God would perform it. That's verse 21 there. Verse 22, again we're in, back in Romans 4 if you got lost. It says, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now again, when were these conversations taking place? These were right before the conception of Isaac, which was after the sign of the circumcision. So this is right there in chapter 17 of when this was 17 and 18 moving forward and when this was going on. It says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. That's the key. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. If there's any question in anybody's mind, that should clear it up. That we get in because we believe on Him, it says, that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, Jesus was, and was raised again for our justification. There's that justification. It is through what Christ did that justifies us and our faith in that which is then demonstrated by the good things we do for God and he talks about that but that gets trippy for some people that's why I'm spending so much time kind of dragging through this to make sure we we get that straight and we don't get off on the side thing and say well the good things I'm doing is earning me merit with God no it's not the good things you're doing is evidence that you take your faith in Christ seriously enough to do what is right simply because it's the right thing to do. Putting some stones in the crown. Putting some stones in the crown. I like that, yeah. Like Bedazzling the crown. Yeah. Kind of like Saturday that some three people called in and I was supposed to get up at three after being there at seven. Right. 
and they needed help and I didn't necessarily want to go back in and help but you I didn't, didn't have to either and I didn't have to but it was the right thing to do and ended up staying to like 7 p.m. right that day so I didn't necessarily want to but I knew it was the right thing to do All right so Kind of like how and you're going to keep her balanced because she'll let yeah. people run all over. <laughs> That's the, you, you get into that casting your pearls before the swine what? kind of stuff too. Sometimes if they're just taking the man, but you weren't you know doing it because they asked you to. I just you just it, felt I like I need to go in there and I help them. Out. Exactly, and that's yes. because you know it's the right thing to do. And, and because God was leading you back in. Right. Uh, and see, that can be a testimony. Absolutely. When people, they're working at the store, and they're like, well, Joy, she always comes back in and helps. And none of these other people do. What's different about her? And she does it with joy. <laughs> with joy. Yeah. Joy does it with joy. <laughs> and, that's a me- yeah. and that's a message to all of us is if we're doing things for the right reason and people notice that, they'll start asking themselves, "What? why are they doing that? Yeah, you know, it's not for the money. It's not for the ignition, you know, acknowledgement. It's because it's the right thing to do, and they'll start seeing something in us that's different. And that's the point of the works. Yeah. That's the whole point of the works. The works are about to show you're different. To show that we are different from the world, exactly. And it ain't about you. Right. It's about you, Christ in it's us. That's about you. Exactly. Right. And and that's your testimony, even if you never tell anyone in your whole life about it again. Right. People are watching. Absolutely. And that's going Absolutely. off of, like, it's not about you. Like, do not be boastful. And right. Because Which Paul talks about, about later on in the book yeah. of Ephesians. Exactly. <laughs> so this all just really ties together. But he's driving this point home that there is a, a structure. Faith is what it's all about. Works is definitely important. But we got to keep them in the right order and for the right reason as we're moving forward. Evidently, the Romans had this all messed up. The Church of Rome, anyway, had this all messed up. So he's spending a lot of time focused on that. Moving forward next week with chapter 5, he's really going to drive the point home about being justified in the blood of Christ. And that is how we're truly justified. Any last questions or anything? Would you clear it up a few things? Amen. (laughs) That's why I like to dig into this. All right, we'll close out online. We'll see you guys next week as we get into chapter five.